All right, there we go. As a small biz pro, I saw we roll using procurement, program, and control. As a small biz pro, I saw we grow using procurement, program, and control. I'm a businessman, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah, I'm a businessman, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah, I'm a businessman, yes, I'm an entrepreneur. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Business Zone with Crystal and Gilbert Buchanan, your small business paramedic. And today, folks, welcome to the Business Zone. For those of you who haven't seen us in a while, we're now live and direct today, live and direct. So please go ahead, go to Facebook, and uh, you can log in live. You can go to uh, YouTube and log in live as well. Crystal, tell us a little bit about our show. Okay, so you guys tuned into the Business Zone. We're here every Friday. We are here as your source of information to help you become business ready, uh, bank loan ready, and contract ready, and just anything to do with business. This is what we're here for. Given and I, this is our passion, uh, sharing and helping our community to make sure you have all the information that you need. So we have a great guest today, Gilbert. Yep. I am... Um, this, this 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 guy here, he's been in the community doing his thing in a creative kind of way, but yeah. he's been making some major milestones. Uh, he sits on some powerful boards, and so we're proud. We're happy to have him, and we look forward to him being part of the show. But before we do that, uh, Gilbert, how was your week? Oh, my Lord. My week has been like... Uh, being at Six Flags on a, one of those roller coasters. It's been up and down, up and down, crazy things here and there. Uh, we've got quite a bit of program going on. And as you know, Crystal, I'm affiliated with a lot of uh, organizations. Uh, the Los Angeles Urban League is one of them where I run the uh, entrepreneurship center there for small businesses. And uh, we've, we've got quite a few grants coming down the pike. So we're preparing small businesses and getting them ready for, for, to apply for those grants. So that's one thing. Then we've got a lot of other small businesses that we're preparing to be business ready and contract ready. And uh, that's another situation there. Uh, so we're just nurturing these businesses, you know, you know, when you have a kid crystal and you're trying to get them to go to school in the morning, they don't want to wake up. They don't want to ha have their breakfast before you take them to school. You got to shepherd them and coach them along. That's how it's been with some of these small businesses that we're working with. So I, I was telling somebody <laughs> that the other day, Gilbert, I was saying it's absolutely amazing People, you start businesses because you want to be successful. You want to make money. But so that means in my mind, you do everything that you possibly can do to make that happen. Right. Right. But sometimes our business owners, we pull and kicking and screaming, man. They are like <laughs> resistant. <laughs> and you, know, you know, in my space of, of, of accounting and bookkeeping and, and record keeping. Oh, man. I, I, I did a workshop this morning. 11 or 12 people on and so i'm talking about you know and these people have been in business for a while they've been yeah. in business not just a year but they're like oh that's just an overwhelming part of my business <laughs> <laughs> it's the money part man it's the money part <laughs> that's right that's right uh, it's unbelievable man so we just gotta make sure we keep doing what we do crystal uh it seemed like a thankless job right now and we know that <laughs> because we've been in the industry for over 25 years we know that but we just gotta keep doing because at some point they're going to thank us. They're going to say, oh, Crystal and Gilbert, thank you guys so much for sticking with us when we didn't want to listen. <laughs> but every now and then I get it like, the, so the class was two hours. The webinar was two hours. About midway, somebody typed in the chat, oh, my God, this is so exciting. <laughs> I'm so excited. That was it. Made my day. <laughs> they, they, got the, they got one of those aha uh -huh moments, right? <laughs> And you know it's amazing, Crystal, because for for 
professional consultants and I should say super consultants like you and I, it's like that just makes our day. You know, no matter what else is going on for the day, once we see a comment like that in, in the chat when we're, we're teaching or coaching a, a, a session, that just makes a day for us because at least oh, one made, person gets it. <laughs> one, day, one person got it. It made my day. And then last night, now I did. So last night I did a uh, a, a webinar on that se that sexy subject of business taxes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's truly not even something somebody wants to talk about. But again, I had two only two people that showed up but they were excited and so that made me feel good that it, even though it was uh it was only two people those two people were just like blown away by the information so excited and so i was good, I, I was good with, my, with my two little people and they were excited about getting their taxes and understanding the tax system and so there you go those were my two highlights for the week was um those are the parts of my business that I find sexy, but not everybody else does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. It's on, And then with all of these economic opportunities coming down the pike, uh, we don't want our small businesses to go through what they went through last year when the pandemic started. Because a lot of them applied for grants and loans and they were not ready. And because they were not ready, they couldn't get any of these fundings. So we want to make sure that they understand that that's not what we're doing this time. You know, you know, how, yeah. you know, people say, no, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> that's not yeah. what we're doing right now. So we want to make sure that they understand that we're here to help. And you got to prepare yourself. And we also want them... Um that a lot of times they didn't get the funding last year, oh, mainly because they didn't have the financial report. So that's my thing is yeah. don't get turned down for something that you easily could have accessibility to by just, you know, getting, you know, you, we, it might, it's, it's a learning curve and yeah. it might take a month or two, but other than that, you don't want to be turned down for a, for, a, for help and assistance. Yeah. And these are grants. We're not talking loans. Don't let them turn you down because you can't put together a profit and loss statement. That yes. just makes no simple. That's just yes. simple stuff. Yeah. Income coming in, expenses going out. That's it. You can that that's an easy uh uh process to take make happen. So that's exactly it. that's, that's exactly. all I wanted to yeah. Uh, that's that's my job on, on this planet. And the thing about it is, Crystal, you and I, we we burn the late night candle, we do all these things, and you know, eventually. We know these businesses, they're going to see what we're doing for them. They're going to see that, you know what, at least we got an advocate in our corner. Maybe we should start listening. You know, just like with the, just like with the kid, right, the teenager, that's, they're going to keep rebelling. And at one, point, <laughs> at one point, they're going to go, you know what, my parents are really there for me. I, I think I should listen. I should listen on this situation. <laughs> But that usually doesn't happen until they go to college. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And, and have their first child. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So. so we're very hopeful. And really what we're trying to do, we're trying to turn turn things around. We want to um, we wanna get them to become self-sufficient. We want to make sure that they start looking at wealth management, wealth protection, and wealth legacy, you know, so that, later on 10 20 30 years down the road they can see the value in uh, the wealth generation that they're putting forward and as we all know you cannot get rich working for the man <laughs> that's that's no. just a fact <laughs> you cannot yeah. get rich working for the man unless you put together some type of legacy program for you and your family so that's and what you we're part of these businesses and so you really yes. want them to produce for you and you want them to be able to take care of your family and yes. then of course then you want to be able to create legacy and yeah. we all know it's very important right now especially in the black community yeah. that we close in the wealth gap and yeah. we have that opportunity right. by creating successful entrepreneurial small business uh, ownership and yeah. you know that's that was greenwood that was yeah. black wall street just yes. small businesses that were working together and supporting each other 
and in putting their millions of dollars in their bank and being able to provide for themselves. If we can become that self-sufficient grouping of people, we, we'll be on top of some stuff, Gilbert, if we can do that. See, what I don't think America and the world knows is that after the green during the Greenwood Greenwood and after the Greenwood um, era, mm -hmm. America has produced more uh, inventors, black inventors, than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. Because that's when people, when people, well, well, I should say, I, I take it back. I should say, post um, uh, the emancipation period. Mm -hmm up to the Greenwood period and mm -hmm. after the Greenwood period is when America produced more inventors because mm -hmm. we were suffering so much that we created a lot of things to make our lives easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when our next guest come on too, I'm sure he can attest to some of these things because in the art world, I know that there's a lot of inventors in the art world back then because they had to do things their own way because the other side wasn't recognizing our skills and our talents. You oh. see what I mean? You know, <laughs> last week we had Michael Anderson on as an architect. So, you know, Paul William was an architect. The man had to learn how to draw upside that, down. That's what I'm he talking stand about. stand on the same side of the table with his white clients. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that we are a mighty people. If you yeah. learn how to draw design buildings upside yes. down <laughs> yes that's amazing that is amazing that is it's like putting a it's like putting a one-legged man in, in a hundred meter sprint right <laughs> he had to learn how how to sprint on one leg right that's how pass. it is for us yeah pass. <laughs> exactly that's how it is for us we gotta right, figure exactly. out ways so unbelievable so we, man. We have to be, we just have to be dynamic and magnetic, magnetic, like our ancestors were. Yeah. Uh, Cause they overcome, they overcame so many obstacles to be successful. And we know there were millionaires and multimillionaires that were created during that time. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think I, I have optimism that we can do it. We just yeah. have to do it together and we have to create that. Um, uh, we have to create that village to make sure that we're successful because everybody else does it. Um, with that, I want to share something before we bring David in. Um, a bit to, uh, last night, I participated. Was it last night? I think so. My days are ran all together. But I was on a, I was on a webinar uh, that Robert Cecito for Community Build uh, had uh, had scheduled and it was about gerrymandering and, and redistricting. And so there's a couple of things that when we talk about us as a community, so redistricting is a real serious issue for the Black community and making sure that we're represented and that our voices are heard. And from what I was understanding on this on this webinar, uh, other F it, it affects all ethnicities, uh, but the other ethnicities had it, uh, engaged, and they were speaking out and reaching out to uh, their in, their their um, their representatives. Yeah, representatives. So we, as a black people, need to do that. And the other issue is that's really important is there's a a, a gubernatorial a re-election or ex election going on right now, and we really need to go out and vote because uh, again, it makes a big difference if we change the governor right now based yeah. upon who is on the governor ballot. Yeah. Um, we have to remember at the, as the state of California, we're a sanctuary city. Uh, we, we have immense wealth in this state and we want to make sure uh, that um, we are represented here. But if we let a change take place, and I understand you guys are not happy with the current governor, but uh, uh, you, it's better to keep what you got <laughs> than to bring in the unknown that's going to create major havoc. And I'm going to share this video with you so you'll understand why this is um, um, why this is so critical and crucial to us at this point. And hello, Veronica. Glad to have you. Uh, Veronica is saying the ownership of our Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall will be the central location of our Black Wall Street and 
which is why we cannot lose our mall ownership to Trump and his racist friends. Okay, so that was from <laughs> Veronica. Um, I am going to share. Thank you, Veronica, for that. And I am going to share uh, this video so you guys will understand uh, how this is explained. Let me do the share here. Let me do this part here. What's happening? Oh, here. There we go. Got my little blue button. And let me put us over here can to you, the side. Can you make the screen bigger, Crystal? Yeah, I am doing so now. Oh, here. But getting your stuff insured once you get there? Oh, that's... uh. So, you want to know what gerrymandering is? First, let's start with Government 101. In the United States, each state so elects a certain number of representatives uh, based the on the state's, state's population. Represented the larger your population, we are the more representatives you have. Each and representative it, um, represents a district or a geographical you, area, including its voters. Uh, Ideally, we want to have a range divided. of representatives who reflect and, the political uh, views of the population across so the state. For but how do we decide who a, gets to a, vote um, for each representative? A, Let's look um, at an example. Suppose we have a very one. tiny so state of 50 this people. Is, 30 of them uh, the belong to the blue and the party, blue. and so 20 the blue belong to the, the red party. Democrat and just our luck, they all live in a nice, even grid with blues on one side of the state and reds on the other. And so now, let's say we need to divide the state into five districts. To, and I don't know Each where district will send one okay. representative to the House to represent the people. Fortunately, because our citizens Hold live on in a second. neatly Let me ordered just stop grid. Share for one second, because the sound didn't come up. Share sound, that's why. Okay, now let's go back. Is it sharing? Ideally, we want to have a no, range of not. representatives who reflect. Huh. Fortunately, because our citizens okay, so live I'll in a walk you through it because it's I was easy there. to draw so five lengthy this is districts, the way it two would, for the reds you and three for the blues. See so what? I'm hearing, I'm hearing the, the narrator, Crystal. I'm hearing the narrator. Okay. Now, let's say instead that the blue party controls the state government you and they get to decide how it? the lines are drawn. You can, can you hear it? Rather than drawing I, I'm still hearing the narrator talking. So that in each district there are six blues and four reds. With a comfortable blue majority in the state, each district elects a blue candidate to the House. The blues win five seats and the reds don't get a single one. Oh well, finally, what if the red party controls the state government? The reds know they're at a numerical disadvantage, but with some creative boundary drawing, they can slice the blue population up such that they oh. only get a majority in two districts. So despite making up 40% of the population, the reds win 60% of the seats. Not bad. This process of redrawing district lines to give an advantage to one party over another is called gerrymandering, and it's nothing new. The term gerrymander is named after early 19th century Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry, who redrew the map of the Senate's districts in 1810 in order to weaken the opposing Federalist Party. Our example is, of course, a huge simplification. In the real world, people don't live in neatly ordered grids sorted by political party. But for politicians looking to give themselves an advantage at redistricting time, the process is exactly the same, and the consequences are very real. Gerrymandering is at least partly to blame for lopsided representation in the House seen in recent elections. And, it's been argued by the President, for political polarization, since representatives don't have to compromise hardline views in order to win seats. That is amazing, Crystal. I really do believe that our audience need to watch this over and over again. I think we should put this link in our uh, chat <laughs> so so they can right. have access to it. <laughs> yeah. So amazing, right? <laughs> yes. So so why is so important that we understand these things and be connected? Because just that little the uh, shifting and. You, and restructuring and you lose power yeah and you lose power so that's really really important that we um that we be more connected we take we take part in more meetings that will give us that information so i am going to <clears throat> uh, put that in the chat room i mean in yes. the chat so everybody can uh, see that and study that on their own <laughs> and uh that's very that's it's very very important uh, yeah. So you guys, um, uh, again, just make sure where's the chat over here 
and this explains gerrymandering, but makes sense, huh? And I would go one step further, Crystal, to say, okay, imagine you're in a household with eight people, right? You got your parents, your mom, your dad, and you got mm -hmm. your siblings, and they're, they're set up at the table a certain way. And then you decide to go in and gerrymander the order of how people sit at the table, then you'll have more people on one side than others based on the gerrymandering. And those people are gonna get allowances. So let's say the allowance is structured <laughs> so that certain amount of people who are more in, in the number, in headcounts, they get money, then that's how this whole thing is gonna affect us. It's gonna affect unemployment, it's gonna affect economic development, it's gonna affect every type of opportunities that could be out there for us. So we need to see this as something serious. That's something very serious. I was blown <laughs> away. I was like, at first, I'm like, why am I at this meeting? And then they showed that's like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, and, you, and, you know, you know what else is tied to this, Crystal? Redlining, redistricting, yeah. and redlining. That is another thing that's tied to this. So that should be our next show, you know, maybe next week or the next two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, let's do let's talk about that because again, this is the purpose of this platform is to keep us informed and let us know that things that are out there, and you know, sometimes we get so caught up in our own lives that we don't realize that there are things that are going on within our city that is greatly affecting us. And then after the result of the election, you're like, What happened? Yeah, well, that's what happened. Yeah. And we didn't even know that this was yeah. going on behind the scenes. And now it's like a chess move, right? Yeah. You, you, you're not aware of the, 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 the rules of engagement. And so now, of yeah. course, it takes place and you're like, well, what happened? What, why did we get left out? Why yeah. did our votes not count? And, yeah. uh, and we found ourselves in those places on several occasions. So I just thought I wanted to share that on the show today. I, I know we, I know we got to move on to our guests, but I just wanted to add this piece, Crystal. This bogus census that they, they did recently, right? That is what contributing to this gerrymandering because they realized that when they did the census, they wanted to exclude a lot of people. They wanted to say, well, you know, if you're of a certain ethnicity, we're not going to include you. If you if you live in, in a certain household, but you're not going to college or something to that, or, or if you're going to college, we're not going to include you in this household. You got to be mm -hmm. counted somewhere else. So mm -hmm. they did that and then they attach it to the gerrymandering. So if a household has usually has eight people, but now they have three because five of them went away to college, then that's less headcount that they can count that's towards. You, count. you see what I'm saying? Right. So, that, so all of these things are tied in. All of it is tied in. And uh, and I do get it, Veronica. Veronica says she doesn't mind uh, supporting Newsom, but she wants to make sure as Black voters that we demand that he support. And Veronica, I want to say that we need to make every politician that is we are voting for, they all need to be accountable. Yeah. But we have to make sure they're accountable. We have to become the squeaky wheel. Yeah. And we have to demand that we can't sit back and assume they're going to do the right thing for us. Yeah. We have to be the one to demanding that. So yeah. uh, right now, that collection of clowns that I saw in, in the in the, in the gubernatorial directory, yeah. uh, those are not people that I want representing me. Yeah. Uh, there was one guy. This was his bio. Go to YouTube. That was his bio. <laughs> Go to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was just like what the heck not some of them no political experience whatsoever we already know based yeah. upon the presidency what that looks like when someone is not uh you have to have experience yeah right yeah you've got to have some experience in order to be in positions of high power like that yeah. somewhere you yeah. had to forget the governor. You need to be the street cleaver. We needed to have elected you as the street cleaner first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before you jump to the governor. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to switch over and we're going to bring our guest in. I'm so happy that he agreed to come on the show. Um, Mr. David G. Brown, he's an award-winning artist 
educator and and publisher he produces pub, uh, political cartoons graphic novels and comic books with positive messages for young people um uh, David is a certified teacher of arts, media, and art at the Los Angeles Unified School District, and he's an instructor of cartoon art uh, for the California Institute, and he's a political cartoonist for the La LA Los Angeles Sentinel and the San Francisco Bayview newspaper. He's been awarded multiple prestigious merit awards for the best editorial cartoon from the National Newspaper Publishers Association. Uh, with that, Mr. David, want to welcome Mr. Brown, want to welcome you to the business zone and to well, let you know we are very happy to have you. Well, thank you so much for having me and Gilbert and Crystal, you know, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that resonated with me a little bit in your early dialogue, when you talked about, um, you know, the challenges that we have, you know, as people of color. And early on, and this lesson that I learned early on in my career, because I remember I was inspired to work in advertising. And I, I realized early on that I wasn't going to, to, to be successful depending on a particular company, a manager, or other people, you know, to in order for me to secure my success. So so early on, I got that entrepreneurial spirit. And I learned as much as I could about the business and how I could be successful at it. So um, so I don't know if you do you want me to talk about an overview. Give me yes, sir, yeah. sir, yeah. this this is your this is your platform. This is your canvas. Go for it. So I'm gonna just yeah. wanna give you give you an overview of my career journey. I I started out working in advertising. And one interesting thing about one of my first jobs in advertising, I worked for a newspaper very similar to like the penny saver here in Los Angeles. I worked mm -hmm. for a paper called Chopper's Guide in New Jersey. Oh, and, I remember that paper. And, and I remember um, th that was one of the first jobs. Well, okay, let me let me roll this back just a little bit. So when I was in college, at my college, I worked for the student newspaper. And that's where I really started doing political cartoons. And I became the associate editor. So that gave me the opportunity to learn about, about advertising and creating ads and the different revenue streams that was coming into um, the the student newspaper. So that was very helpful in terms of me understanding how how that industry worked. And when I graduated, I got a job at Shoppers Guide. And I remember there was this Italian guy, and he didn't have the experience or the knowledge that I had. And I mentored him. And mm -hmm. so we became friends. And six months into this job, guess what happened? Well, he became, he, he became boss. your boss. <laughs> <laughs> and to add insult to injury, they laid me off. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. So that was, I mean, that was a, a gut punch for me. Yeah. But it also, and I'm really glad that that happened at that stage of my career, because then that inspired me to understand that. I, if, if there's going to be success in my career, I was going to have to create it myself. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, I learned as much as I could about being entrepreneurial at, at what I did. And, and one of the interesting things is I know sometimes young people say, oh, well, you, you create comic books. and you, you do That must be a lot of fun. Um, but I want to talk just for a minute about uh, creating a book. I mean, mm. and, and the reason why I was compelled to create books is because I didn't see the kind of books that I felt uh, I wanted to see, you know, as a young person. I mean, mm. I didn't see superheroes of color, you know, when I was growing up as a teenager. Um, and I didn't see uh, stories and lessons about uh, people, African-Americans. And the whole process of publishing a book, I, I just want to talk about that for a minute. And although it might sound exciting, oh, well, he, did, he gets to be creative and write a story and publish it, but it's like, it's like that maybe 80, 90% that 
that of the work before you actually get to the creative aspect of it. That mm. that 10, 15 percent of it where I can be creative and do my own thing. But the other aspect of it is how do you raise money for it? How do you get a sponsor for it? How do you distribute it? So you have all those other aspects of it that you have to to put in place before you can do that that creative uh, portion of it. So, so and it's a book. Really I mean, when you're writing a book, it's a business, right? I mean, it's you still business. have to know who's going to be who's going to read the book that right, you created, right. and making sure you have a marketing strategy and all exactly. that, right? So there's branding, you know, which which is actually building who you are and, and building an audience. Uh, then, the, then the marketing aspect of it, um, the producing part of it, where you know where where are you going to get the funds for uh, to actually to get it printed and distributed, and so I think it's important to understand you know the, the industry and how you can be successful with it, but understand the different aspects of it. David, let me ask you this. So most artists, <clears throat> they have the whatever the genre that they're uh -huh. their, their specialty, but they're really drawing. I mean, if they're they're artists, they're really just more of a right branded individual and more right. uh, create uh, more about the creativity part right. of it than they are about the business side of it. What made you uh, choose political cartooning as opposed to uh, comic strips or any of any other? Well, type? actually, what, what, I've what done. Was well, I've done comic books. Um, I have done a comic strip too. <laughs> okay. And, but political cartoons, I mean, actually, um, it's funny how, you know, my my uh, career kind of evolved. You know, I mean, sometimes um, opportunities present themselves. Sometimes it's timing. Uh, so um, it was something that I started, well, I started political cartoons when I was in college. Mm. And at the time, we we had like a little uh, housing crisis where they were, where the, the the housing was overcrowded and students were complaining about it, and and I presented a cartoon about it to the editor of the student newspaper. So that that really kind of started my career in terms of cartooning. I mean, I didn't think that it would it would lead to a professional career, but it was something fun to do because I've always liked to draw. You know, you know, as a young person. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not to get into a whole idea. So I'm going to tell how I ended up at the Sentinel is um, it began uh, with the 1992 uh, civil unrest here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And then I got a, a mini grant from the Cultural Affairs Department to do a book about healing the city. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. I created this character called uh, the L.A. Phoenix. And I'm going to. If I if I were, can I share the screen for a minute? Yes, you can go ahead and share. You. Uh huh. Um, I want to show you that. Let's see. Okay. Uh, can you see that? Have you? Uh, did you click the? Uh, Let me double click the, on the, 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 um, Probably need to, to share a screen down below. Right? Yeah. There you go. Okay. And so now you want to make sure you go to your desktop because right now there you go. Can you see it now? Is it? Is yeah, that is that okay? Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so I got a mini grant from the city of Los Angeles Culture Affairs Department to do a, a, a comic book targeting kids in the community, and the whole premise of it was this African American super, superhero that arises from the ashes of the riot, and the focus was using all non lethal we lethal weapons and to bring the people together in the city. So I ended up doing, I, I had a mini grant to do a small black and white version of it. So, but I got so much um, exposure and publicity for it. I uh, ended up doing, finding out about how to publish a comic book and I did a three book series and, uh, and, and commercially. And so it did really well. And that kind of launched my, my comic book career. Um, wow. So, now, so, so David, can I ask you this question? And I want to ask I want to ask you this question for our audience out there mm -hmm. who, who might be in a similar or same field as you are and they're trying to emerge. They're trying to get into this field. So, 
how did the grand situation work? How did you present it? Because you were a for-profit business, correct? Right, right. So, so how did you present <laughs> yourself in order to get this grant? Did you say, hey, I'm putting together a program, a platform that can help this demographic of people, and we're looking for a grant to help us spread the word, right? Is that kind right, of what you did? Right, okay. Right. So um, did you have to put together a formal grant application or I had did to you put just together a grant application, which is very similar to a, a business plan, if you will. Right. Because you act, actually have to f figure out, okay, what, what do you need? And then how are you going to effectively um, present that to the audience that uh -huh. it's going to appeal to? Uh -huh. uh, so I do want to elaborate a little bit more because the, the the second part of it is I created a program for kids. Yeah. That was also through culture affairs. Right. Uh, now, can you see that? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So after I did the Phoenix series, I, I was invited to go to come to schools, community centers, libraries to talk about my Phoenix character. And I found that young kids, they wanted to create their own comic books. So I presented the idea of an after school program that created the opportunity for kids to create their own comic books. So this, through a series of workshops, I did, I started off at William Grant Still Arts Center and then the Watch Towers, I created a, a program that was called Tales from the Kids. And so I would do a weekly workshop, teach drawing and writing, and it would culminate in the kids actually actually publishing a book Ooh. that the kids could be part of. And, and it was a great opportunity for the young people. And several of my students have gone on to work in the industry, whether it's film, video games, television, as and this was a springboard for them to, to be able to do that. Hmm. That's awesome. Isn't it awesome when you have students that you know that they got what you taught? Because sometimes yeah. we don't, it's not instantaneous, right? And so they've learned it as a certain age, and then you look up and they're actually uh, making a career out of it. So something you said about them or said to them really resonated for them to go that next, those next steps. And, and many, uh, many of them use the artwork that they created in my workshops as their portfolio to get into Cal Arts, you know, UCLA and other programs. I mean, to, to have someone, you know, have to be published, I mean, that, that has a lot of value to it when it comes to, you know, applications for, for school. Hmm. So yeah, that kind that's of awesome. to my career. So, and the reason why I mentioned that is, uh, you know, when you were talking about the Sentinel, so, so I was I was doing comic books, and I do have some other comic books I did with uh, community related issues, and I'll, I'll share that with you for a minute. But but I was mostly known for my comic books, and uh, the Sentinel. This was around two thousand two, and the Sentinel's editorial cartoonist uh, was retiring, and so they actually reached out to me to see if I wanted to take the reins and continue doing political cartoons. So that's that's how that, that happened. It's, it's always exciting when somebody reaches out to you as opposed to, you know, so, so it puts you in a really strong position of strength. Yes, yes. That means, that means there's something you're offering that one, resonate with them, and two, they are interested in, so that's why they're reaching out to become a part of it. So, so I want to share a couple of the books that I've done. Um, okay. um, and then I also want to talk about uh, the, the, the business structure in terms of that. Okay, so, so these are two books that I did. The, the one on the right, uh, Dying to Smoke, was a actually a partnership with the NAACP and the AXO program. So um, I would say, what was that? The 90s, like the mid 90s, when there was a lawsuit by the cigarette companies. And so there were grants available to for anti-smoking 
uh, mm. promotion. And so they had, and they, there was a, one organization that was specifically targeting African Americans. So I partnered with the NAACP and specifically the AXO program and created a grant, wrote a grant to uh, get funding to do a book about an anti-smoking book. And one of the wonderful things about this was I actually worked with some teenagers and they helped create the storyline and the content of it to, uh, and to, to and help distribute it throughout the community. And Excellent. The, and now the second book is called Steps to a Drug-Free Life. Very similar, I uh, got a grant to um, buy this organization called SHARE out of Beverly Hills. And it allowed me to actually create this book uh, uh, based on the 12 step program. So I took the 12 step program and created it into uh, a graphic novel form. And I created different characters, identifying the different uh, 12 steps to uh, move away from drug um, and alcohol addiction. Uh, then I want to show you at least one more. Okay. So uh, I like the way you partnered up with other organizations. Yeah, that's important to, to be able to do that. Um, yeah. Did you identify the grants or were they coming to you with this is a grant out there? How, how did that how did you tie those two together? Well, you know, I mean, every relationship is a little, is a little different. I mean, the one with the NAACP, I mean, I already had a relationship with the NAACP and the AXO program. So that was, so when I found out about the grant, uh, I basically wrote it and then had them sign off on it. The, mm. the one with the, the drug-free life, they actually approached me. They had seen some of my other work and some of my other books, and that's what prompted them to reach out to me. To do that, so, so I mean, it could go either way, but um, but I think it's it's important to be able to understand that there's different options. I mean, the the Phoenix books uh, that I published were um, self-published, and also I funded those, so I basically made the investment myself to create that that the LA Phoenix series. The tales from the kids, they were from grants from the city of Los Angeles, so. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that was a little different in terms of uh, of of how how they were funded. Mm. So, for those of you who are just tuning in right now to the Business Zone with Crystal and Gilbert, we've got a very special guest on our show. His name is Mr. David G. Brown. He's an award-winning artist, educator, and publisher. He's even an artist. And Mr. Brown, I wanted to ask you this real quickly. Sure. Uh, back in uh, 2009, October of 2009, the U.S. State Department and the Brazilian Consulate, they sponsored an art exhibit and a cultural exchange visit for you to go to Brazil. Would you mind telling our audience a little bit about that? Sure, sure. I'd, I'd be glad to talk about that. That that was like an incredible experience. I um, thought so. I um, thought so. I had, <laughs> From my from my Phoenix and I and, and you know I had got some some international exposure, uh, especially when I did the Phoenix um, and and it was it was a, a wonderful springboard. I mean, I when I created that project for for cultural affairs for the Phoenix, I got a call from CNN. So I was on CNN being interviewed by CNN. Wow! Uh, for that, so I got a lot of good exposure. Um, there's an organization called the International Visitors Bureau here in Los Angeles. And what the Visitors Bureau does is they connect people from internationally. Like for instance, um, I have a friend, well, he's a friend of mine now. There was a gentleman out of Brazil, his name is Mauricio, and he was coming to Los Angeles. He's a political cartoonist in Brazil, okay? And so when he came, um, and the International Visitors Bureau, basically their function is to, when you, when an international traveler comes to a city, they want to connect you with people that you think you might have something in common with or you'd like to meet. So 
So they reached out to me and I met this gentleman from Brazil, who is also a, polit he's a political cartoonist in Brazil. So uh, in 2009, they were doing an international, international um, exhibit in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it was, uh, you know, Africa, France, all, all these other countries. And he reached out to me to be part of that. So I was actually representing, uh, you know, North America. And I also got support from uh, uh, the Brazilian consulate to do that. So they basically paid for me to, co to, to fly to Brazil and be part of this exhibit. And, and it, it was a really wonderful experience. One of the things that was interesting uh, to me in terms of experiencing how comic books are used internationally. I mean, growing uh, comic books to me were either, either they were funny or they involved superheroes. In Africa, France, Portuguese, oftentimes, this format is used culturally to enlighten people culturally. Also, to, in terms of civil rights, uh, and, 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 and th I mean, they would feature things like torture, you know, injustice. And mm. so, so it's, it's, it's really dis diff different in terms of how we see this medium, uh, you know, depending on the country and how you're exposed to it. How did you, um, because obviously you started your career before there was the internet and Instagram and <laughs> Facebook and, <laughs> and, and Twitter. <laughs> so how did you, and you were in a newspaper, right? So right. how did you actually get all the exposure? And do you think, you, where would you think your career would be if there had been an Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter well, when you started your business? Well, I, I well, first let me say this. I mean, it was a lot of work. I mean, in the 90s, when I uh, created my Phoenix, I just promoted it, you know, any way that I could. You know, mm -hmm. I wrote press releases. I would send out press release packages to different media organizations. And I would and I would make phone calls and then and then also building relationships. Mm. Uh, like I had a little write up in um, uh, the LA Weekly, the LA Weekly when they were mm -hmm. around. And mm -hmm. what I would do, and and then there was also I had a write up in the LA Times. So I wouldn't. So if I had an interview, I would make note of that um, that reporter, and then I would build relationship. So. I call up so and so um, um, and say, "Hey, you know, I got a new project. <laughs> you know, <laughs> can I take you to lunch?" <laughs> I like that. I like that. And, and that's I, that's I, good. And I, that's good guerrilla marketing. And, and, and I, 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 I mention, love it. I want to mention Erin Aubrey, and she she was at the LA LA Weekly, and she writes for uh, the Black Enterprise, but. Um, but she was one of the writers that really that she did a write up for me in the LA Weekly, and so so I think part of it also is is you know reaching out to reporters and say hey you know I'm so and so you know and here's my latest project, and so I I, I think part of it is that I mean I, and I don't think you can get around it. I mean nowadays you can do it social media and Instagram and but I but I think it's important to establish, you know, your brand. And you do that by, you know, building relationships. Um, and, and I think about, you know, when I first came to Los Angeles um, and the first job I got, and I always tell this to my students too, I, I first job I got, I got through a classified ad, right? Hmm. But every other opportunity or job I got since that, first job was got I got because of a relationship or somebody that knew me or they knew my work and that opportunity was created from that so so I think I mean the, the short answer to that is I think you just have to you have to put in the work 
So then you have always thought of your business, you, you've always thought of your art as a business then. So it wasn't just yeah, something yeah, that yeah, you yeah. did. I, th I, th I think early on uh, my, you know, when I graduated from college, I mean, my ideal job was going to be working at, on Madison Avenue, you know, in the ivory tower, you know, with the window view, you know, working <laughs> in advertising. I mean, that wall, you know, you know, just working on advertising. But I realized that um, that that wasn't going to happen. You know, that wasn't going to happen. And 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 I, and I think that um, you know, as a, you know, most of my the work environments that I've been in professionally, I've been in most cases the only African American. And so you get used to being in an environment where you're marginalized, you know, mm -hmm. and you're, you're passed over. And I, I and, and I think you're underestimated. So even though, you know, I've always kept a nine to five, I've always had that, that, that hustle too, uh, where I created my own, you know, in, in terms of that. So tell us, Mr. Brown, tell the audience, uh, I know you've got a personal list of clients that you've worked with mm -hmm. that done, uh, I should say, uh, boast some of your promotional yeah. work, such as the Los Angeles uh, International Airport. Yeah, actually, uh, I, actually, I'm going to put up one from the airport. I don't know yeah. If, do, I, do I need to share and, it? Yeah, go gonna, I'll, I'll do it. Hold on. There you go. Okay. All right. So, so the airport, and it's interesting how, um, you know, the program that I did with Culture Affairs really was kind of a springboard for lots of other opportunities. So um, I had the opportunity to work with the um, community relations department of, uh, of Los Angeles Airport. And so I created a, an after school program for kids and we learned about art. We also learned about um, aviation, you know, what makes, you know, vehicles fly, you know, how does a balloon fly, you know, or as opposed to a plane you know, the four forces and that kind of stuff. So, so, uh, so it was a great opportunity for me to work with some young people and work with the airport. I also designed a logo for them and some other things. So that, so that was one of my, one of my clients um, that I did some work with the city of Los Angeles. And then I've also done, this is an annual report I did for uh, community partners, which is an umbrella for startup nonprofits. Mm. Um, I like that. I really like that. Yeah. Uh, so when you're teaching children, because I know you work with the you work with kids just like I do. Uh, so are you um are, are you teaching them to use their arts, their talents, and their skills to to look at it as a business? Or how, well, how do you? Well, I and let's well, talk know, about your business structure. You know, so I officially retired from LAUSD. So like, that was like last year. But it was, uh, but I worked as what they call a career technical education teacher, mm -hmm. and so, um, and by that, my role is to prepare students for uh, careers. So mm -hmm. my class, I taught design, I taught animation, and one of the other things that I did is I certified students in the Adobe programs. So, so mm. that's a really important aspect of it and give them a, a, a leg up in terms of, you know, being hired in the industry. Uh, so, um, I, so my classroom was actually a certification center for students. And so, um, I mean, we live in Southern California. And so, um, you know, we got the film and television industry, we got advertising industry we got publishing industry, we got the web. And so these skills would help students, you know, create job opportunities for themselves in internships. So, um, so, but, but I try to be, um, to tell them the truth about the industry. I, I know sometimes when you're young, oh, I like to draw. So, so, but where do you, where do you take that? And, one of the mm -hmm. things I often talk about is, uh, if I can make an analogy, with the industry being a landscape. Mm -hmm. And, and a, a big part of it is understanding how do you navigate that landscape 
to be successful and, and, and to monetize the skills that you do have. You know, because just like any other landscape, there's going to be hills, there's going to be valleys, there's going to be lakes, there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be walls. So all those are going to be there. And so just preparing for that and knowing that you may have to change strategies, you may have to change the niche that you're going after, and also being being aware of changes in in the industry. And one of the perfect example is being a political cartoonist. Mm. I belong to a, the American Association of Editorial Cartoonists, which is uh, a, an organization, international organization of political cartoonists. And when I first joined in 2005, 2005, there were 600, this is just in America, 600 political cartoonists. What, really? Yeah, that worked for newspapers, okay? Oh. So, so, so well, there's only a few black ones, so. So maybe 10 of those were black, right? Yeah, the, maybe the other six, the other so 590. Yeah, but now there's maybe 200. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, because the newspaper industry has evolved and changed. Yeah. You know, yeah. How, how do you get your news? I mean, there was a time. Uh, so, you so, get your news through Google Feed. Yeah, I get exactly. my news through. So, uh, so it's I all on news. online. My news comes so, online. When I first came to Los Angeles, I was subscribing to the LA Times. Up, up until maybe a couple of years ago. So yeah. as newspapers demise and the industry demise, so does those opportunities for cartoonists. Mm. So, and there's not a model created where uh, you're gonna make a lot of money or make the kind of money you can make being hired for a newspaper on the internet. And then when you do put something up on the web, everybody, if they like it, they'll steal it, they'll share it. And yeah, that's so, true. <laughs> so, you, so you're not you're not gaining any. Re you might get some exposure, additional exposure, but you're not gaining any revenue uh, from from that. Mm -hmm. so, so so my point is that you know as the the industry changes, you're going to have to adopt and change. You know, change with it. If uh, I were if I were an art student venturing out in industry. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you tell me to get me prepared to take on the types of things that you experience, but to avoid those things? What would you well, tell me? Well, well, first of all, I would have them identify what, what their passion is. I mean, you know, every artist kind of has something that they're passionate about. Like, yeah. like, I, you know, I like cartoons. I like superheroes. I like, you know, that's something that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Um, or, or and some some artists they like to paint, you know, or some artists you know are sculptors where they like they want to do they like to work with their hands. So first of all, I would, I would say identify, you know, what your passion is because I think you know once you find your passion, then you don't mind putting those hours in because it's going to take some work and time to do that. Yeah. Uh, and then take an overview of the industry. And where would that passion and work that you do fit in? Would it be fit, would it be the industry that I have a passion in, or an industry in the art uh, uh, art industry? Well, I I think either or. I mean, like for instance, the perfect example is if you're a fine artist, then you're going to build relationship with galleries, you know, uh, and, and what have you. Or if your passion is you know animation, you know, then you're going to be looking at you know, the film and television industry, where you might Netflix, where you might fit in in, in, in terms of that. Uh, or if you like publishing, or, or maybe you're just a graphic designer or an art director, where you can work at maybe an advertising agency. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, because there are a lot of options in terms of that, but I would say, um, first identify what you're passionate about, and what you want to do, and then, what aspect of the industry, you know, do you do you feel like that that would fit into? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like the web. I mean, there's incredible opportunities creating websites. If you're a good designer and understanding how websites work, I mean, that might be an area. If you like designing covers for books, 
you know, maybe a book publisher. Um, I, you know, I, I freelance for um, advertising agency. So, uh, you know, I get to design a billboard, you know, or a poster. And I guess in one of my, actually one of my first um, projects working in, in, in television and in, in film was um, uh, working on the poster for New Jack City. So, oh, wow. So, and working on and Jungle Fever too. So I, I worked with the art director for for Spike Lee, but uh, but but what I'm saying is, I mean, there are lots of diff different opportunities, you know, as an artist, as a designer, um, and understanding how that, you know, how you might fit in, and not only that, but also trends. Like for instance, um, uh, I just I just did a, a a new book about the pandemic. I'll I'll show it up for you. So. Um, uh, why are you pulling that up? Uh, uh, Andre Paravenu uh, asked a question of you. Would you consider, who would you consider to be the closest successor to the great J.A. Rogers, formerly with the Pittsburgh Courier? I, he considers him to be way ahead of its time. Oh, the, oh, the cart cartoonist? Is he a cartoonist? The cartoonist, Andre? Andrew? Andre? Yeah, I'm, a, Rogers, I'm, 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 that... I'm assuming he's a cartoonist. Uh, his name was uh, J.A. Rogers with the Pittsburgh Courier. Yeah. Are, he, you he, Are you familiar? Are you familiar with him? Unfortunately, I'm really not that familiar with him, and I, but I probably need to be if he's a black cartoonist. Yeah, they said he was a pace setter and way ahead of his um, time. I, I got to meet Maury Turner, and Maury Turner uh, did uh, the Weep House. And he was the first syndicated uh, black cartoonist. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah. My nephew is going to uh, SCAD um, uh -huh. and leaving in September, actually, uh -huh. uh, which is a university, uh, the art school in, um, in Savannah, Georgia. Oh, great school. Yeah, he's going, uh, uh, he should be leaving the first week of September, but he's always been interested in graphic arts. He spent, he did his undergrad, he did his AA at West LA College. Um, okay, that's a good school. And now school. he's going there, a good school. That's great. Yeah, that's he wants to be um, graphic. What does he want to do? Wants, film. Film, he wants to be film and uh, behind the scenes, the video editing and-, and Well, the other thing, the other thing I would say and encourage him is, is try different things. I mean, you know, just don't don't limit yourself to, uh, uh, and, and sometimes opportunities present themselves and sometimes you can create opportunities or create your own opportunity. So. Yeah. So Andre is trying to unmute himself so he can join the conversation, but for okay. some reason he but said I'm not he's... AJ Rogers. I'm not. I'm... Well, I'm gonna uh, tell him to put it in the chat. He can't really unmute in this platform. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, Andre, but... if you if you could put the comment in the chat for us. Uh, well, I'm gonna look I, him I, up right now. Andre I... Parvenu. Uh, we appreciate you joining the business zone. This is great. We're on every Friday from three to four. Uh, with Crystal and Gilbert. And, and what we do here is provide advice, coaching, and some consulting for small businesses looking to become business ready, contract ready, and bank loan ready. And our very special guest today is Mr. David Brown, David G. Brown. Mm -hmm. He's a cartoonist and educator and artist and uh, a, a phenomenal person. He's oh, also <laughs> he's also a member of the African American Museum. So uh, he he's, actually sits on the board over there at the yeah. California. African, yeah, we're getting uh, ready to be open real soon, and you're, I'll, I'll certainly reach out to you because yeah. I want I want to do um, we're going to want to do some programming, especially targeting young people, because I think access and opportunity are key yeah. uh, to success, especially in the arts. Um, and I, I want to use the museum as a platform to be able to expose our young people and understand our history through, you know, the black art. I think that, that would there. be great. I think that would be great. And if the business zone could team up with you to I would, do that, I would love we that. would love that. Yeah, I would love that. Because I, I want to. I'm, I'm go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. Go, it's okay. I, go I, ahead. I just want to re, re, uh, mention one thing. Um, 
in terms of being an artist because I, you know, the, the artist journey is different for each artist, you know? You, yes. You know, you, you have different passions, there's different reasons. I mean, at one point, you know, I was going to be a musician. So yeah. if I was an artist, I would have been a musician. <laughs> and, but but that's part that's part of that journey. Yeah, is to be able to explore and try different things. Yeah, you know, try it's, film, try it's animation. A, it's a part of the stuff. family. It's a yeah. part of that entertainment and, family. Yeah, and so uh, so I think that's important. Not to um, I know oftentimes we we might admire someone and you you want to follow their specific career. Uh, but you know it's a variety. I mean, it's timing. You know, it's what opportunities are there for you. It's um, who's who's inspired you. Yeah. So I, th I think it can be different for uh, for all of us. Yeah. You know, as creative people. So now, our now, our listener, our viewer listener, uh, Andre Parvenu, he put a link up there in the chat, which tells you a little bit about who yeah, Jay. Jay J.A. Rogers was yes, is Joel that Joel August Augustus? Yeah, Joel Rogers. Augustus Rogers. So we're gonna check him out on Wikipedia there, Andre. Yeah, I, I just brought him up too, and he's an author, journalist, and historical illustrator. So yeah, thank you for sharing it. Yeah, see, <laughs> Andre, you taught us some things today. <laughs> this is great. We, we love it. We're gonna have Andre on this show. He's yeah. also an urban planner and a commission oh, okay. commissioner in Los Angeles. He, he wonderful. He's been, yeah, he's been doing his stuff out there, but he's an urban planner for the LA, for the county of LA. Um, Thank you so much for that because I think we're we're always learning. I mean, it's it's yes. always it never really stops. And plus, we always want to learn about our history. We want to learn about yeah. our folks who have contributed to this this society as well. Because you know they they do their best, and I keep saying <laughs> they because they is those folks. On the other side, <laughs> who try to block us? <laughs> so they do their best to hide a lot of our valuable history and some of our trailblazers who've contributed to this country, the development of this country. So, uh, Andre, that was amazing that you provided that info, and we're going to continue to to on on unveil a lot of the the, the history that our forefathers, foremothers are provided for us. And, and it's actually, you know, when we talk about art and music and we go back to our African ancestry, that was a, a part of who we are. Oh, right? yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Well, art was our way of communication. I, I even learned recently that, you know, you see women with cornrows, right? Well, there's right. an actual history that not only does it come from Africa, but during slavery time, when they were um, um, mapping out uh, 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 the runaway, oh, they actually they, they did it in the corn roll, right? <laughs> in the corn roll, man, so I didn't even it, think about that, Chris. Right, so the corn rolls were absolute actually maps, oh, right? Wow. And so, wow. and it let you know. Where the rivers were, it let yeah. you know where the forest. I love were, it. You know where to be the danger, and so when Harriet Tubman was um, uh, 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 helping slaves escape, that's what they used. They oh, used man. they used the cornrows, the, the pattern. Amazing. Of about did you not? Isn't that wonderful. amazing? That's amazing, <laughs> Crystal. I did not know. You know what? I kind of thought about it, but I said, "No, nah, that's not what it is." But this is amazing. So, well, you so know, I, little... you know, I okay, actually David. I did a book called Adventures in Jazz, and mm -hmm. it was for kids. It's part of the Tales from the Kids program, and I talk about you know the, the evolution of music and how like the slave songs evolved into like the blues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of rock and roll came from the blues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, even those songs that we sang back then, those songs were messages telling exactly. us that, hey, Massa is close by. Watch <laughs> out. You know, Massa is trying plotting against us. You know, so <laughs> those songs were communication. You know, so and the oh, 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 they act like rap is something that. No, the rap is not new. That was something they were rapping in the, in the field. Well, yeah. isn't that what isn't that what reggae is about? Joe oh, is yeah. also a, a a recording artist. He actually was a, a, a reggae artist in Jamaica. Oh and yeah. Our song yeah. is actually written by uh, yeah. Gilbert. 
So, yes. but isn't that what with uh, isn't that the original uh, hip hop? Was Ag- Ag- oh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly <laughs> where it came out. Nineteen sixty-two. That's where it came. Sixty-one, sixty-two. Around about then. That's how it got the original rap started. Then by by you, Roy. Yeah. And that that's really how it went. Now, Andre said that um, J. A. Rogers traveled uh, to over sixty countries and used political cartoonism. Towards mm. our social justice and political rights movement. Wow. And and uh Man, also, that's my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. So so yeah, there here's I'm gonna share one of um um uh David's cartoons I pulled up. And uh so here we go. And so I, 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 this one really resigned me. Is Harry oh, which one? Oh, that telling one. Uh, Andrew Jackson to move over. Ah, <laughs> You're being replaced. I love it. I love it. I love it. Your time is up, brother. It's my turn now. I love it. That's You're cool. very but, but talented. Trump would have stopped to that. Yeah, very, very talented, and and I think it's absolutely awesome, especially in a time where polit when when politics is so volatile, being able to uh, find that humor in there, but at the same time deliver a message. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm going to show a couple more recent ones. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, go yeah, ahead. I'll, I'll stop sharing. Go ahead. It's okay. You know, Crystal. Right. I, while he's doing that, I'm thinking that we could work together in using him creating cartoon characters for Small Biz Pro, the business zone, to let <laughs> let our audience know, you know, the value of this. I'm serious, man. This is this is amazing. I love well, it. Well, you know, I'm always looking for opportunities. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is amazing. I mean, again, it's sometimes... You know, people people are not you know readers. I mean, there are those of us that are readers, but most people are not. This really gets the message. And I saw this one. I saw it in the, in the Sentinel when you did this one. Yeah. Uh, people messages that are, are are graphically designed for us really, I think, resonates with us much faster than yeah. us having to. Read I, I, I do think so, and I do think that. Uh... The younger generation is more of a visual. Uh, yes. Yes. Because, because believe me, I know they don't write. <laughs> they don't write. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Um, and so, and I and I do think a, a strong image will stay with you, and is more powerful, uh, you know, than reading the paragraph. I mean, I just, I just think it, it you know, it just has a way yeah. of really having a, a strong impact. David, I'm definitely yeah. going to reach out to you because I think we've got some, you can definitely produce some images that will help us to reach out to our entrepreneurs with a program that Crystal and I are trying to deliver. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, your your cartoonism will really, really help. Okay, all right. I, and, and I like that he took his his art and because I, we, we talked about this before we actually started the show today, mm-hmm. uh, how so many of our... Um, uh, artists and very talented individuals are dist- uh, are redirected yeah. to yeah. go into a field that they can make money. And I remember, and you know, my one of my best friends who passed away two years ago, Vita Brown. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, Vita. Yeah. yeah Vita was Vita yeah. was very talented. She did the. She, she's a curator at, at right. Cam, yeah. but also she had been <clears throat> so connected in the art world. Yeah. As you know, she went to Pepperdine. Uh, was an amazing artist herself on many and many platforms. You know, you know I didn't know that. That she, I, yeah, I, she was an was artist. That. She she had some beautiful artwork. She did jury design. She did. She was a photographer, but she never felt she could make money at that. Yeah. So she focused in on yeah. art, uh, being the curator, being yeah. part of the the jobs and the careers that right. were in the yeah. art world. But she could have easily had her own exhibit at yeah. at the at the uh, uh, museum. Yeah. yeah. And and she um I don't remember M Hanks um, oh yeah uh, she I just saw him cur- the other day yeah yeah she was the curator uh for M Hanks uh, we went to many a, a art opening down there she lived and breathed art so there was more yeah. to her than just yeah. the art 
but you right. wouldn't have never known that because right. she never felt that the being an artist itself could be yeah. something that she could make a living at, and she could but, have. But you know, it's but I think I think it's it can be really tough, and it's a journey, and you know, yeah. it's and it's different for all of us, and. And sometimes it's finding that right niche, that that right opportunity, uh, or that place that you fit. And 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 I think it. I mean, even now, I, you know, I'm still evolving, you know, as an artist and as a creator. So um, I, I don't think it ever really stops. I think all of us who has a craft, we're always evolving because we're always learning new things, and yeah. also. We're always learning how to transition over yeah. to the next generation yeah. and, and the yeah. next uh, decade. So, yes, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Now, one of our viewers, Veronica Spigner, said, wow, Crystal, I didn't know that. I guess <laughs> I guess we can call the cornrows cornroads. <laughs> so, that's I good. I like that. I, I like that, Crystal. That, I, mean, I, I, I had read that recently and I thought, how amazing is that? But I also, and you, I've seen it in a couple of movies that mm -hmm. uh, they use the Bible in, and, I, and, 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 and uh, David, you said this as well in, in songs, but the Bible was also a directional. They used Psalms, the, the book of Psalms, mm -hmm. as a directional as well. Uh, so once they found out what the roads were, then when they would go to the different stopovers uh, along mm -hmm. the um, a Freedom Trail there, there was a passage from Psalms that was written on the wall to let them know, or, or, or sung, to let them know where the next stop was. You know, some brilliant creative. We, we, <laughs> we are very, very creative, irrespective of what they say. <laughs> we are very creative because, like I say, I mean, we know back in Africa how things were in terms of communication. We know it, here in America, it's the same thing. In the Caribbean, it's the same thing, also, where yeah. you know, we would develop songs or poems or skits. Or conversing because they didn't allow us to have like two or more people gather together because they figure you're planning a revolt. So mm. if you have two or more or two people, then we would start a song, letting them know what's going to happen tonight, <laughs> letting them know what we're planning next <laughs> week, <laughs> and that's where the cornrows come into play. <laughs> well, well, and, and another example that in Brazil the. Capriella, I think that's what they call it, where they look like they're dancing, but they're actually yes. it's a way of self It's a martial art. There you go. It's a martial art. Yeah, the martial there art. There you go. Martial art. Yeah. So, so I'm, just, I'm just so over, I mean, whenever I think <laughs> of us as a whole, yes. and, and I am just always so enthralled with yeah. The, our ingenuity. Yes. I mean, we kind of well, created something out of nothing, right? Yes. Like <laughs> well, you know, I what what inspires me when I think about the obstacles and challenges my answers had, yeah, and, and and the things they were able to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, so what I'm doing is a breeze. It's like compared to, <laughs> to some of the challenges that they had. Yeah, you know, and and, right. and I always feel blessed to to have you know, this opportunity and then to be exposed to what I've been exposed to. And that's why it's also really important to me that I share that, you know, with well, the next generation. Well, I think Crystal and I are going to bring economic development to your repertoire of <laughs> <Okay>. artwork. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to, you know, join forces with you and have you do some cartoon about what we're trying to portray in terms of Hey, hey maybe I, maybe we can do a book about entrepreneurship. Yes, I like that idea. Yeah. Yes, we uh, would love and that. And I was thinking, David, maybe because one of the biggest focus we have right now is on closing that 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 wealth gap, right? Yes. So being able to let's say look back at at uh, during COVID and some uh -huh. of the, the pivoting that our businesses were forced to do. Right. And some people are being very successful at it, but there are still steps that we need to make. Right. So maybe there's some some cartoony way, yeah. <laughs> some book yeah. we can create that's on a on a level to inspire and, yeah. and motivate us to closing yeah. that wealth gap. Yeah. 
And and we can start it out on paper and then move it to the digital level where we have yeah. it in a video format. Yeah, you sure. see what I mean? Sure. I, I'm ready. I am ready. <laughs> I know Crystal is ready too. So yeah, let's do this. Man. We got to just like Gilbert and I were saying at the top when we were doing our dialogue is what do we need to get people motivated and excited like our ancestors? You yeah. know, I can just, if I were to put myself back at Greenwood at Wall, Bright Wall Street, wow. to walk around proud and to know yeah. that you've created this yeah. community, they threw you this community with that they thought had no value. Right. And yeah. then you took it and you created it and masterminded it into a, a wealth uh, uh, a wealth resource for your own people and just imagine if no one had ever record because they don't yeah. really pay attention to what we're doing right. it's only <laughs> when we, and let other people in to yeah. let them know what we're doing yeah but just hey what's imagine, going on over there <laughs> yeah it's all, it's just those people over there they ain't doing nothing and then somebody comes in it's like hey they got lots they got an airport. <laughs> yeah, they got they got their own doctors, their own lawyer offices. They got a jet. <laughs> they got a jet. <laughs> then that's when the problem starts, right? Yeah. But I just yeah. think about how resourceful we are as a people, and how can we motivate and inspire our people uh, to replicate our ancestors yeah. and what they've done over the years, and how can we change? And even maybe it's just our children. I know that's what blows me away about teaching entrepreneurship to kids is the ideas that come out of their little minds. Yeah. It's just awesome. And you saw it, right? You, yeah, I, I, I was really inspired by by them. I mean, I, there was two students. One was, he wanted to do art on clothes. Yes, I, uh, that was uh, Raheem. Raheem. Yeah. Um, you know, and him and Natalie both, I mean, I... I had the opportunity to talk with them extensively and showed them some of my work and gave them some ideas, but uh, the incredible potential that both of them have. And, and so the week after biz camp or that first week of August, we went to, we did another class and I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but you might be interested in it. I'm going to mm -hmm. put it up. It's called my one of one and uh -huh. this young black guy, my one of one. Hold on, let me. My one it. of one. My one of one, and what it is is a site where you can create your own custom T-shirts oh, and design okay. it with your um, with your apparel, uh, was your design. Was that how? Uh, oh, no, this this wasn't his. Yeah, no. This okay. guy. His, this guy is a young black guy that started. Oh, okay. um, of this program. Let me see if I can get into it. Um, and so I created some, I'm not an artist by no means, no, on uh, no level, <laughs> but I am. Everybody has some with... creativity in them. So don't, oh yeah. Right. So with I'm going to take you over business. and I'm going to show you what we did. And, but the kids were the ones that were really super creative and uh, so they're using this platform. So this platform is actually a platform where you design your own apparel, apparel, and you put you or you can use your own designs. You can use their designs, but you can really create your own. And then this become your merchandise. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to uh, show you in my studio here some of the stuff that I created. As uh, soon as it pops, populate, populate. Come on. And so you might want to, uh, you might want to, and uh, and uh, research this as well, Dave. But if you want, well, to I did some something merchandise. similar to that with my students. I had them; they designed um, a logo for their class, and they put it on sweatshirts. Like, yes, with, and like so hoodies. this, uh, like hoodies, and this mm -hmm. this particular. Um, store what they i mean this particular site what they do is you can take it and put it on um their uh okay so this is some of the stuff that on i different designed. products 
on their products and then right. they're the ones that do the, sh the 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 mailing out they do the drop right. shipping and everything i like that one i like that one crystal <laughs> yeah so that's gonna be our merchandise for the business zone i like that one <laughs> yeah turn your yes make, to make, yes make it make the screen bigger so we <laughs> can all see it <laughs> i love it that's as big as it'll go because that's <laughs> the, 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 the some of the stuff so i bought i created did a whole apparel line based upon turning your to to um to nose I and it. it's got a t-shirt you mean turn your kids, nose into yeses you right turn your nose into yeses. <laughs> so the kids actually created their own designs mm -hmm. and uh and they are now uh so now we're they're going to sell their products and they so a lot of those kids that you saw that were being very uh, creative uh they now have um they now have so this is a t-shirt that i created i'm waiting for them to come back and so it's gonna be t-shirts and tank tops and 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 backpacks so wonderful it's, it's, yeah and this, this is a young black guy that actually uh he's the founder of this program so you oh. buy them you design it uh and then you use their collection and then you can create your own merch line from it wonderful. Yeah. i love it yeah i love yes. it his name is Michael, really talented young man. And he came up with a way uh, to expose it to kids. So he, mm -hmm. another revenue stream is it being part of a, tr a, a educational class. And mm -hmm. then, the, and then you, you, the, uh, like we did, we bought a package right. where the kids got two or three designs. Oh, uh, we paid for the t-shirts. Yeah. And now the kids can actually go ahead and create their own line. That's great. So, um, Mr. Brown, if you um, is there anything else you want to share with the audience that they haven't heard yet? Uh, what, your contact information, how they can get a hold of you. Um, I can I can put my can I put it in my in the chat? Which which one do I? Uh, so there's uh, two chats. It, okay, you, can, you you can put it in a private chat if you want. I can copy it and paste it over into the public okay, chat. Because I was trying to figure out how to get to the. The, the public live chat, the yeah. public chat, and I don't, I didn't see a way to do it. Yeah, so you do the live, you do the private chat, and then we'll copy and paste okay. it into the live. Okay, so I'm gonna put my uh, my website, although I need to update it. But <laughs> okay, yeah, and put your, an email <laughs> also if you'd like an email where folks can reach you and mm -hmm. and just like just like Mr. Andre Parvino did with you know providing you that great information on joel augustus rogers i think that was great information mm -hmm. so that that would be excellent so while you're doing that i would like to let our audience know uh our business zone audience know that um crystal and i on the business zone we are launching a special campaign to help many many small businesses become business ready contract ready and loan ready and here's what we're going to do. We're, we are willing to uh, have at least five of you, five of you, uh, do an assessment with us. And based on that assessment, we'll go over your business. We'll see where there are glitches and where we need to improve your business. And we'll bring in experts on the air, if you're willing. We'll bring in experts to give you some advice and feedback on your business, how you can grow that business. And this will be of no cost to you. The business zone will foot the bill on that. Okay. So you guys, you guys can access a lot of support services. So Crystal, you want to share some more with the audience? Yeah. So we're going to send out, uh, Veronica just said, me, me, me. <laughs> uh, so, so we're going to send out an assessment form or and and send it guys over to you or some sort of form and then uh and then you get it back to us and then we will uh, uh you'll do the assessment that's what we're going to send out you're, you'll do the assessment and find out what your areas that you need some help in and yeah. then Gil between myself gilbert uh, our ex expertise but we're also going to reach out to our colleagues that also have expertise and i heard a lady to say it the other day 
that have areas of genius. I just thought that was so classic. I was listening to a podcast and the lady, when she was talking about subject matter experts, she called it areas of genius. Yeah, I like <laughs> so, that. I so like those that. with areas of genius that can help you become uh, the premier genius in your space. Uh, we're going to bring them to the platform. And so we're going to have an online uh, session and we're going to watch you change and turn your nose into yeses. So we're excited about it. We're working on the marketing and branding material. Now we're going to get the um, uh, assessment out to you. You, We're going to send it out to everyone. I'm going to send out a blast and then we're going to select the, 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 the individuals that want to um, have their analysis. Uh, uh, Veronica's already putting her stuff out there. Good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and if you want to analyze and you want to do it on air and you want to meet our colleagues and help them give you some tips uh, and some um, uh, suggestions and recommendations to take your business to the next level, we would be very happy to have you. So um stay tuned so maybe by by september we should be all ready for it and that's going to be part of that merch line i just showed you guys so you'll be able to buy t-shirts and backpacks and everything we, uh gilbert and i are in the place we want to monetize the business zone so these are some of the ways we're going to do that so yeah so and in that. the process we're going to help you guys grow and, and, and right um we are happy to, that you guys tuned in. David, you've been amazing. I uh, love Thank your you. journey. Love that you've taken your uh, your passion and turned that passion into a, uh, a career, a successful career that you've become um, notable in. And we we as a as a member of our community, we applaud you on all that mm -hmm. you're doing. And we're you're, we're your fan club, too. <laughs> okay. yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. And we're definitely looking forward to working with you to put these cartoon um, pro campaigns together so we can get the message out to all of our entrepreneurs yeah. so they can better understand what we're trying to do to help right. them. And uh, it's just going to be amazing. So we thank you so much for being here this week, Mr. Brown. Okay, you're welcome. And also, Crystal, I, I have some books I want to, I don't know where I would drop them off. It, it, the oh, urban for the kids, league, maybe? Yeah, yeah to the it. Urban League. Um, I will the, the reach out to you and give you Bonnie's okay. phone number so that when okay. she's in the office, you can drop them off there. And how many students do you have? Uh, in this particular class, we had 20. I think we ended up with 25 kids, both with the Biz Camp and okay. Biz Institute. Uh, we will actually, the kids are coming, we're the kids are coming back together in um. September, no, October, okay. and we're going to start our Biz Institute uh, program, okay. which is year round. And so the All kids right. are going to be now developing that. So we will we'll have another opportunity for you to come out and talk to the kids. If you, I mean, come virtually and talk to the kids. Um, the kids are going, I, I just crafted a concept with the Black Business Expo. So the All kids right. are going to have booths at the expo. Oh, and then we're going to have a, a pitch competition for the kids. And then the kids are going to receive uh, some um, uh, cash awards in that platform as well. So if, any, if you guys want to be a judge, we'll be looking for judges. And the Black Business Expo is going to be November 20th. And it's a virtual platform. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Of so course, I'll, I'll reach out posted. and would love to participate. And, and, we would uh, love to have you. Because, you. you know, David, it's so interesting. There's so many kids that come into our program that are very artistic, but they mm -hmm. don't know how to right. mold that into a actual business. Yeah. Um, I am just blown away by how talented these kids are. But usually they just come up with, right. well, I'm going to do T-shirts. Right, exactly. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And, and and I'm like, no, let's do something bigger. We have, I don't know if you know this artist. Uh, his name is Skylar Gray. That name sounds you know, familiar. Sky, so Skylar Gray is a street artist. And Skylar took his craft. Uh, his dad really saw that he was uh, talented. And it exposed him to art history. And so Kyler uh, sold his first, he had a, a, a quad set of 
uh, of artwork, uh, which they're all they're all street art. He sold them for twenty five hundred dollars a piece. Is he the kid that was homeless at seventeen? Uh uh, oh. Skyler. Uh, he was with his dad. He comes out to play tennis with us every week. So now he makes this. He had an opportunity. He met one of the. Um, he met the game, and yeah. the game bought his street art. They introduced him to this uh, Beverly Hills jeweler, and they took his street one of his his paintings and put it in the face of a platinum diamond watch. Yeah, and that was it. Sent him over the top. So wow. Skyler has been selling his paintings for like twenty grand a piece. See, and see, he here, he's here see, in Los Angeles. He's here in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. See, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, Crystal. You see how the game was able to help this kid? Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm talking about that we need to do in our community. At least if every one of us, we don't have to help everybody, but if every one of us could just reach back and help one person, send the elevator back down to one person to help them to come up, it will be amazing. Right. Our our community would be so amazing. It would be thriving. It would be self-sustainable, self-sufficient. You know, it's amazing because look what he did for that kid. Right. He did yeah. this. So this is uh, Skyler's work. Um, amazing. So he, wow. He, yeah, wow. he's very talented. Very amazing. talented. They call him the Fresh Prince of Art. I think that's what they call him. Amazing. Really cool kid. Uh, yes. They call him the Fresh Prince of Street Art. And yeah. he's so he's 20 years old. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Really pretty cool kid. Um, uh, his grandfather plays tennis with us. Yeah. And so he uh, comes. I see him every Saturday, actually. Yeah. He's very talented. Been doing this since he was 14. Yeah. Wow. So this is well, I think work. that's what can happen when you're, you know, you get that encouragement. And yeah. At a young age. That's, this is this is incredible, inspiring. That's amazing. Yeah, That's just he's amazing. Very, very talented young man, um, and so he he's made he's made a career with his art. So um, so we're gonna have him. I actually should talk to him about being on the sh coming on the business zone. That that would uh, be great because that will inspire a lot of others. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's Skyler. So he's been doing that since he was 14 years old. He actually was in the biz camp at when he, he had just started his business and just sold his mm -hmm. first painting when he came to the uh, biz camp and, mm -hmm. and then created his business. Yeah, that's beautiful. All righty. All yeah, right. <laughs> very talented. David, it's been absolutely awesome. It's always a we pleasure are... seeing you and speaking with you and Gilbert. Yes, uh, sir. Great. <laughs> so, so we're going to do some partnering together. We're going to figure okay. out what that looks like. <laughs> and so we're going to close out the show. And uh, so thank everyone for coming out to the Business Zone with Crystal and Gilbert. You can find us here every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Um, to four, but sometimes when it's just too good, we just have to kill. <laughs> 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 and, and you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe and you can check out our archives. Uh, uh, David, we've been on the air for five years um, this year. Wow. And so thank you, Andre. And thank to all of our listeners Thanks, and viewers Andre. that come out every week and uh, continue to come out, tell a friend and go over and subscribe to our channel uh, so that you will get a notification uh, when we go live. Thank so you, Andre. That, Appreciate it. Another great you, show, Veronica. Veronica. <laughs> thank you, Veronica. <laughs> and so, Gilbert, if you want to take, take us, us on, out, <laughs> you guys look in the in the in the um, chat. Also, um, David, the chat actually uh, uh, populates onto YouTube and and to oh, Facebook. Okay. So, Good. so your information right. is out there. Okay. On, in in the in the cyberspace there. So Gilbert, okay. and, take and, us on and, out. And also before we 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 sign out, I want to remind you guys to go to the business assessment link that we posted here in the chat. Go ahead and do your assessment for your business so you can see where you are, where you score, and you can you can cite uh, as a referral partner. You can put Buchanan and Associate, or you can put Recycling Black Dollars on there. 
and we will get a copy of this assessment so we can bring in the necessary expert to work with you guys, okay? But take the assessment so we can see where you are, so we can help you, all right? And and I want to tell everyone to go over to the um, to the Black Business Expo and register. We're looking for vendors, and we definitely want you to be there. August is Black Business Month. Nobody ever talked about it. <laughs> it was this month. It's <laughs> Black Business Month. The month and, is almost over. <laughs> and I think I'm the only one talked about it the whole entire month. <laughs> but in November we are going to uh have the expo and we're going to have dr george um frazier is a speaker uh dennis dr dennis kimbrough he is celebrating his 30 years in the business as an author um and as well as dr adrian tony and treasure owen so I want you guys to go over there sign up and buy you get your ticket and if you look at if you want to have a booth Booth rental is available as well. We'd love to have you. We want this to be an amazing uh, event. Uh, the founder, uh, Barbara Lindsay, everybody knows Barbara Lindsay. She used to use to do this uh, physically mm -hmm. uh, at the convention center uh, every year. So we're supporting Barbara and making sure that this is a successful event. And um, so I just wanted to add that before we left the air. And check out Veronica's event. It's called Success Fest. Veronica's event is on August 25th to 28th from 8 to 4. So check it out. And okay. we want to thank our special guest, Mr. Brown, again. Thank, thank you, you very much for being thank here. You. And on behalf of Crystal and Gilbert on the Business Zone, we are out. As a small biz pro, I saw we roll using procurement, program, and control. As a small biz pro, I saw we grow using procurement, program, and control. I'm a business man, yes, I'm an entrepreneur.